as some of you know, I dedicate my sermons each week uh, to someone. Um, and among the someones this week that I dedicated this sermon to is Pat Liebchen. I would ask for you to pray for Pat. Um, on Monday, she was walking to mail letters to friends at Westminster Thurber, and as she was crossing the street, she was hit by a car. She has been in Grant Hospital and is recovering. Um, Pat is truly one of those who lives out this gospel. She cares for everyone. And so I ask for your prayers for her, cards for her, calls to her. Remember Pat today. Will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In the Hasidic teaching of Judaism, you will find this story. A man died and was brought before the heavenly court. When his sins and good deeds were placed on the scales, his sins far outweighed the good deeds he had done. Suddenly, an angel in the heavenly court placed a fur coat on the scale of good deeds, and when this happened, the scale of good deeds shifted and became the heavier scale, and the man was sent to paradise. On the way to paradise, he asked the angel who escorted him, I cannot understand, what did the fur coat have to do with my judgment? And the angel replied, on a cold wintry night, you traveled on a sled and a poor man asked you for a ride. You took him in and noticing his thin clothes, you placed your fur coat on him to give him warmth. That single act of kindness offset all of your transgressions. I love this story from the sages of Judaism. It reminds me of the power, the weight, the balance given in the parable of Matthew 25, known to us as the final judgment. Here Jesus offers his very last teaching in Matthew, the final judgment, just before he enters into his passion unto death and ultimately his resurrection from the dead. He begins with these words in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, all of them, and he will separate people one from another, as a, separ as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he's going to put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. On the surface, this parable seems very simple. It's a story about sheep and goats, of people from all the nations of the world. The sheep, of course, on the right hand are the righteous ones. They do amazing things for their sisters and brothers. They feed them. They give them something to drink. They, they welcome them when they're strangers. They clothe them when they're naked. They care for them when, they, when they're sick, and they visit them in prison. The goats, meanwhile, are the unrighteous ones. They don't lift a hoof for their suffering sisters and brothers. And for their lack of action on behalf of humanity, they are sent to eternal punishment. Meanwhile, the sheep go to eternal life. Again, in summary, sheep, good, going to heaven. Goats, bad, going to hell. But there's a lot more at work here. None of the people represented as sheep or goats anticipated this kind of judgment. None of them. None of the people had consciously recognized Christ in others, especially not in people who needed help. 
Neither the sheep nor the goats have seen the face of Jesus anywhere. Their behaviors are different, but their perceptions are the same. For those who say, I can't give my time, can't give my talent, can't give my treasure to anyone, especially someone who is suffering because I just don't see Jesus in them, all I can say is, I really pity you. Jesus really pities you because the last judgment tells us when you see and when you act on behalf of those who are the least of these, those who are invisible to most people, your brothers and sisters in need, then you are seen and then you are acting on behalf of Jesus. There's a lot to be said about doing the right thing without seeing God in the action. In other words, doing the right thing is not transactional. It should not be something that you do to get something back. It is spiritual. It comes from something inside of you. It's transformational. It is a seed that is planted within you that places you into action mode on behalf of the other. If a person is hungry, see how simple this is, you feed them. If a person is naked, you give them clothing. If a person is thirsty, you give them something to drink. Thank you. If a person is alone, if they are homeless, you shelter them. If they're sick, you care for them. If a person's in prison, you go visit them. There's a clarity and a transparency at work here. You're not asking anyone what they have. You're not asking about their status in life. You're not asking if they have a driver's license or a green card. You're not asking if they're of a certain nationality or ethnicity or racial background. You're not asking if they're legal. You're simply saying, here is my hand of help. You're not asking them to produce any evidence to show you that they really do need something. And here in central Ohio, you are not even asking if they cheer for the Ohio State Buckeyes or the greatest opponent and real nemesis to our Buckeye football team, the Indiana Hoosiers. You're not asking. See, I don't believe Jesus told this parable to scare us into charity. He knows that Mo that particular motivation would simply leave us trapped in our egoism, even if we did lessen other people's suffering. Jesus knew that genuine encounters with those in need, genuine encounters with the poor and those who are hurting will enlarge in the heart and the vision of the giver. Solidarity makes us more human. He invites us to know him in relationship to his beloved poor. And when we fall in love with Christ in the poor and with the poor in him, we will inevitably want to serve him and to be with them. The reign of Christ in Matthew's final parable encapsulates the gospel ironies of all the firsts and lasts we've heard about of all the losing of life and finding it we've heard about. One way to sum it up is captured in Pope Francis's words several years ago when he said, when we decide to know, to love, and to serve Christ, we will end up smelling like his sheep. I love that. That's when we know that we're among the sheep too. As Jesus points out, the person who meets his sister and brother where they are and serves them in their place of need is truly blessed. They see enough to sense the need of another, but they don't see enough to realize it's Jesus they're serving. This final lesson of life and faith that Jesus leaves with us is so profound that we actually do a disservice to God in Christ to talk it into the ground. One of the challenges of being a preacher, it should serve as a guide to each of us to simply step up and meet those needs and get to be with people right where they are. So with that said, 
I'll leave it alone and end this sermon and this church year with one final story. It's a story shared years ago by Father Henry Nowen. It goes like this. There was a monk who was traveling from his monastery in the desert to a city to purchase spices and necessary items for cooking. As he traveled along the desert highway, he found himself in a total state of bliss. He was happy. He was feeling close to God as he joyfully made his way through the desert to the city. And as he walked, he came upon a beggar who was severely disabled. The man was sitting at the crossroad in the middle of nowhere. He asked the monk to carry him to the city so he could beg for money at the city gate. The monk knew that this was the right thing to do. He knew that it was the holy thing to do. He knew that it was the Christian thing to do. So he lifted the man on his shoulders and began the final part of his journey to the city with the beggar on his back. As he walked, the beggar complained that he was not carrying him carefully enough. He hit the monk on the head. He talked incessantly. He put the monk down in every possible way. And all of the bliss and the peace that the monk had felt just a little while ago was all gone. He found himself losing his patience. And all of the joy that had guided his earlier steps, gone. When he reached the city gate, he lifted the beggar from his shoulders, sort of shaking, and he placed him where he asked to be placed. The beggar looked at him and said, thanks for nothing. That was the most miserable ride I had on your back just to get to this place. Goodbye. Before the monk exploded, he nodded, turned, and walked away. The monk was a little shaken still as he shopped and found what he needed and then prepared to return to the monastery. He decided to leave by another gate and make a wide turn around the city so as to miss the beggar on his return to the monastery. As he left the city by another gate, who should he see there at that gate but the same beggar? And once again, the beggar asked for a ride on his shoulders back to the place where they met, practicing the fullness of grace and hospitality, kindness and patience, the monk agreed to carry him. The journey back was even harder than the journey into the city had been. Both men were weighed down, the beggar with alms and food, the monk with food and spices. The beggar once again was unrelenting as they walked the many miles back to the crossroad. Finally, after cursing and kicking and hitting the monk all the way back to the place where they first met, the monk reached the crossroad just as the sun was beginning to set. He put the beggar down, and the beggar said once again, thanks for nothing. This time, the monk could not keep silent. This time, he spoke to the beggar directly. You have made my day miserable. You have complained, you have hit me, you have kicked me, and then when I was kind to you, and placed you down gently, you said, thanks for nothing. I've had it. I am done with you. I hope we never meet again. And with that, he wheeled around and headed back down the road to the monastic home. After 10 steps, he turned back around and looked at the man and asked, just so my brothers can avoid you should they come this way, would you please tell me your name? Unexpectedly, the beggar stood, and he walked toward the monk. And when he was very close to the monk, he looked into his eyes and said, My name is Jesus Christ. With that, the monk fell to his knees and asked the Savior for forgiveness. But with those words, the Christ disappeared into the dusk of the desert evening. We ask, Lord, when did we see you? And he answers, whenever you 
did something for the least of my sisters and brothers. You did it for me. So may we do the right thing, even if we do not see Jesus. Amen.